right so for all intelligent minds watching us it's time to focus on this era of intelligent automation industry 5.0 this is how the title of our panel discussion looks like where we're going to be sort of exploring how data and ai can help in efficiency what are really the brimming strategies around connected and smart manufacturing so as to say the industrial automation also would be taken into account and our panelists could actually explore how to use iot robotics you know these are these are the buzzwords that's the holy grail so we'll delve deeper into it to explore the maximum productivity and also the end to end solutions the implementation the designing the building of secure networks endpoints etc etc let the leading minds talk to the intelligent minds out there right so with that uh, it's my pleasure to be inviting the panel and allow me to please welcome aloknath j the svp cto from samsung india let's welcome him with a huge and a good round of cheer clapping they say is good for blood circulation so keep it all going as we get connected to them let's also welcome Welcome Anupurna Vishwanathan, the CIO from Cummins India. With that, let's welcome Dhruv Jain, the Digital and Industry 4.0 lead from Aditya Birla Chemicals. Let's also welcome Govind Singh, the Group CIO and Executive Director, Information Management from Dal Miam Bharat, and also invite and warmly welcome Manish Misra, the CIO from Panasonic India. Well, our session moderator. uh with whom i was just uh, chatting backstage he joined us very timely let's welcome kamesh srinivasan the associate partner kpmg in india and kamesh i'm sure you're all set i'm not doing a tech check and a mic check right out there so over to you for the conversation starters and of course the dive thereafter with the panel over to you thank you so much shikar very good morning what a great day right? we got a great topic fantastic speakers and a matching moderator to take you through the session today industry 5.0 the boundaries of industry 5.0 is not marked yet and there are multiple definitions uh, which are going on but there's only one thing which is common right? the focus this time is not on tech for a change industry 5.0 focuses on intelligent automations that will bring in experienced customers value to business and partnership with people who adopt and drive these automations if 4.0 focuses on bots 5.0 focuses on bots and humans working together if 4.0 focuses on all the models behind which makes ai work 5.0 focuses on the consumption of ai into business but there are too many open questions challenges in um, adoption of 5.0 is there enough business value Uh, is the ecosystem ready is it practical right now this is sustainable from a long term and what are the impact and implications of industry 5.0 on uh, compliance and data security and you know regulations right we have some some of the best minds uh, from the industry to share opinion on this and let me quickly you know talk about uh, uh, our panel of speakers today dhruv jain is a sharp shooter when it comes to tech he specializes in digitally transforming manufacturing processes using ai and automation he will bring in hands on opinion in large scale adoption welcome to govind singh uh, he is an executive who has been there done all these things with over 30 years of experience in transforming large manufacturing companies and brings in experience and a very strong point of view on making large digital transformations a success he has seen the erp evolution he has seen the ai ml Uh, wave and he he's a very keen follower of uh, impacting society anapurna is strongly anchored uh, on a very strong sense of uh, practicality around digital uh, having defined led multiple large digital transformations across the value chain of uh, manufacturing uh, in fact uh, anapurna is also one of the leading women in ai of uh, 2021 a global recognition by ibm for her shared thinking about ai and uh, and its impact to business happy to have uh, you with us uh, anapurna manish is a technocrat with over 25 years of experience uh, and on a day to day he spends time juggling between uh, innovation and managing product engineering and, and this is a fine art right? um, manish brings in a very great deal of enthusiasm uh, in bringing ideas to life from a consumer 
a product line perspective and is a strong opinion maker in creating the tech ecosystem necessary for large digital transformations. Uh, last, uh, uh, I have Dr. Bay, right? he's a well-known opinion maker in open innovation. Uh, his ability to bring in ecosystems across startups, across CTCs, across academicians into solving future uh, tech problems is, is, is something to learn from. Right? He is the Ethan Hunt of Mission Impossible. He would like to be addressed as uh, the mission tuner for his ability to bring in mission impossible tech problems you know, into a possibility. Super happy to uh, be here with all of you today. Thank you so much. And this next 40 minutes that we have uh, is going to be action packed. For all the audience out there, don't blink an eye. This is going to be exciting. If you have questions, please share it across. We will try to squeeze in them uh, when we have uh, such a wonderful panel of speakers. First question to you from Dr. Day. Why is 500 so relevant right now? And, and what business value do you think it can generate for customers and shareholders? Great, Kamesh. Uh, you know, you set the stage so well. And, uh, you know, as you asked the question, the need comes from the business value in the industry context. So obviously there is a great linkage between two parts of your question. But I would also say that there is a need even otherwise beyond the value. So let me first address that. And uh, what a great day today is Engineers Day. And we as engineers love to create products. Human mind is very fertile. We see value when machine uh, does the routine tasks. We have creativities and we are creating lots of algorithms, processes, techniques, computing devices. That's our bread and butter. And we would love to make the progress out of that. And that has to be recognized as very vital. So one need is to progress from industry 1.0 of mechanization to electrifications, to automation, globalization, and digitalizations. These are the stages through which we have been going. And from 1700, 1800, 1900, it has taken a long time. But now that we are talking 5.0, I think it will be faster. Let me also tell why other needs are. Automation has brought in efficiency, right? We love efficiency and everything. Who wants to stand in queue for a long time? Sense of critical situations. If pressure valve goes up, it shuts down the boiler. We would love to operate. How do you monitor that continually? And particularly if you are not even there. So obviously the machines are gonna do the job for us. We are talking better quality aesthetics part of it. We used to have typewriter. Why did we move to computing laser printer? Gives us a pleasing sense of us, right? So that's the second part of it, of the need. And this journey is also about that. And the third part, I would say that recently we are seeing connected devices, right? IoT, many sensors that are coming. And as I told, you have to sense sometime so you have a gas sensor, all kinds of gas sensors, the soil moisture detector, right? And in manufacturing setup also, you will have many. We have a great manufacturing facility from Samsung, two parts, NIDA and in Chennai. And our NIDA factory has been the world largest mobile factory, you know, creating like almost 90 million devices by the next year into that manufacturing. So these are one journey that is there. And so why not to use these cognitive devices and small intelligence that you add? So on one hand, some kind of robotics, the other hand, the software bots that are coming. up. Now the value part I wanted to address, the second part of it. What is this uh, industry 5.0? There is two needs in particular. One is again a human needs because as the machines have kept coming, I think there is a fear in human mind that is it taking the space and the employment of all of us, right? This fear and this value set disruptions that somehow is being perceived needs to be altered and, and bringing the human value. Maybe we are underrating. We are underrating maybe the machine value, super rating us, but maybe it is time to uh, look into our values. So I think one aspect of it is to bring it human-centric, 
we have emotions, we have queries, we have integration ability, the creativity. These are not yet meant for machines. So machines will do their tasks, specific tasks, but we would like to, through this IoT 5.0, want to bring it into human-centric uh, drive. So that's one part of the value. And this is a big value as a society. It may not be a product value, but this is absolutely necessary to bring the peace and coexistence. And the second value that I would talk, as this comes, you know, we have been wearing shirts like I get, Excel, L, M, S, right? We have to choose out of these four because we had to do a mass production, right? That's the only way it was cost effective. But now if we bring machines and humans, I can get much more personalization service, right? I can have any specific, why not my shoes is, why do I have to fit it into seven or eight? Why not seven and three fourths? This is gonna be possible if the machines and humans come together and start working. So the ability to produce these specific needs and personalizations would be another drive. So I'll stop here by bringing these two specifically on sustainability, human-centric development, and uh, you know, personalizations uh, as we talk about intelligent automation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dave. Right? very beautifully articulated um, with automation, the intent is for human value to get up to right? And you also made a very, very interesting point, which could lead us to the next question to Anapuna. Um, it is not always about value that gets generated. It's also about progress of um, human um, uh, race. Now, Anapuna, to you, between the possibilities of what fiber here can do for all of us and the, the reality of where we are as an industry. What do you think about the journey that, that possibly you know, takes us into 5 of zero? So Kamesh, today, if you look at it, right, 2.0 is, is a concept that the industry has embarked upon. Across companies, you'll see industry 4.0 being implemented in different shapes and sizes and forms and, you know, with mixed successes across organizations. And, you know, multiple, if you if you actually plot the majority, it's that scale is completely diverse. It will vary by industry, you know, by country, you know, by so many parameters. But when I think about industry 5.0 and that evolution, right, from the reality that we have today of that mixed success, early maturity or mid maturity of industry 4.0 to 5.0, I think there is an amazing opportunity to leapfrog. And the reason I say that is that when you think about um, industry 5.0, it is bringing together three technologies, right, or three, three sets of competencies. One is a human competency, right? It's it's the art of thinking, and like Doctor Day said, right? It's creativity. It's um, you know, it's it's everything that a human mind can do, which as of today, a computer may or may not be able to do, right? The second is robotics, right? and the third is AI, and you know, the ability to think. Now, if we are to achieve, you know, certain levels of automation or certain levels of uh, industrialization purely with with connected equipment, right? Which is either machines, so which is either AI or robotics. You know, the cost is going to be prohibitive. The reality is, at the end of the day, these are business problems, right? These are not technology for the sake of technology. These are business problems, and so if if we do have to achieve certain business outcomes with these technologies, they have to be viable. And um, so, but today, if we are to pour that kind of investment in 4.0 to get the same level of output that we will get in a 5.0 setting, because you are you are bringing in the power of a human mind, which is not a replicable proposition, right? It, we, we'll end up doing that at a much more economical scale. Plus, we will be able to bring back the whole um, humanization of you know technology. Right? So when you put the two together. I think there is a huge opportunity to leapfrog because we will find value much faster, much cheaper and integrate back the working of human minds with technology. Brilliant. Brilliant. So, so there is a lot of opportunities for us to leapfrog. 
uh, while this is a business problem, uh, we'll have to take a conscious effort on how do we balance the possibility with the current reality, which, so, Manish, right? You, 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 you run possibly the sharpest innovation uh, hub, house, you know, for, for a company uh, in this part of the world. Uh, how do you see the pandemic actually necessitating a problem of ensuring that we bring in the human centricity and the tech together to, you know, fast forward into 5.0, right? Now, do we have enough ecosystem in this space right, from a tech perspective to get us, you know, moving forward on that? Sure, Ramesh. Uh, first of all, let me wish a happy Engineers Day to all my fellow colleagues and engineers. <laughs> uh, what a day today, uh, as Alok said. Uh, so, if you look at it uh, from a, you know, Industry 5.0, you know, what has happened is that Industry 5.0 wanted to bring the human, societal and the environmental dimension back into the equation. So, while, you know, Industry 4.0 was coined somewhere about a decade ago in 2011 by German, there was a concept which was introduced by Japanese uh, back in 2017, Society 5.0. Now, if you look at Industry 5.0 is a kind of you know, marriage of Industry 4.0 and Society 5.0. And, and, and another aspect that we need to kind of you know, uh, remind ourselves is that <clears throat> Industry 5.0 is not a yet another industrial revolution. It is an extension of, or it is a complement of Industry 4.0. So with that said, you know, pandemic has definitely triggered the digital transformation, digital adoption at a very fast pace, which we have seen, all of us have seen in the last, uh, you know, one and a half to two years. And the pace with, with, you know, the industries are adopting these technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, industry, you know, IoT, cloud, this is moving at a very, very fast pace, you know, as of today. So now what has happened is there is a lot more openness towards adoption of technologies. There's a lot more, you know, openness to accept what these technologies can bring to the table and how you can leverage them, not only for the stakeholders, but also for the shareholders. So entire ecosystem gets benefited out of it. So if you see, you know, in case of manufacturing, you know, everything on the shop floor, you know, assets, machine, you know, there is a tend to move towards more and more automation. There's an intent to move towards more and more contactless technologies. There is a, you know, intention to move at a faster pace of digital adoption. And that is what is happening. Now, what will happen is it all requires, you know, connectivity. It all requires scalability. It all requires human talent. It all requires necessary skills. So this all needs to happen over a course of, you know, next few years. And also, you know, in, in some cases, if you look at, you know, while most of the, you know, big size industries or manufacturing units may be putting millions and millions of dollars, there might be a doubt in the mid size or SMEs, you know, what, what, what is in it for me, number one, you know, and there could be many challenges in terms of cost, in terms of you know time, in terms of human resource. So that's where those industries can start looking at taking a smaller steps, baby steps, and then look at you know having a smaller ROIs and then scaling. I mean, for example, TPM audit is one of the necessity. They, will, they could start automating that on the on their shop floor before going to the next step from a data visualization point of view, then getting the insights, all that. So that's how I would kind of you know, summarize the ecosystem today. Thank you, Manish. Uh, very succinct, right? So, so from, from at least what I hear from you, Doctor and Anna this is a changing operating model and it is here to say, right? Now with all this changing operating model, you have, you, you have tech, you have infrastructure, you have uh, devices, you have machines, you have humans, all these things have to get 
connected and there's a lot of data flow across all these things. Okay. Let's go to, through for us to understand what are the implications of the interconnected world, right? the data moving around with APIs getting connected. How do you see this impacting security, compliance, and what do you think are the regulators you know, possibly thinking about this changing of the monitors? Thanks, Kamesh. Uh, and uh, I would also like to uh, extend my thanks uh, to the entire panel and to the organizers for organizing this event on the Ingenious Day. And uh, saying that, uh, I would uh, definitely say regulators uh, play a very influencing control on how our technologies and implementation and the change in the business processes are shaped at the shop floor. I would answer my, uh, I would give my responses in two parts. We can see a regulator from two perspectives. One is from the uh, perspective of compliance and one is from the perspective of control. I'll start with the compliance. At some point in time, we started uh, in our businesses, a paper-based e-log books. And then there, there was this regulator for the initial uh, two years. He was very stiff. No, I want a paper-based trade. Not only for the e-log books, but all for the truck movements, logistics. I want a paper-based trade, even for purchase orders and the signatories and the authorizations. I want a paper-based trail. I think as and when the landscape and the ecosystem overall matured and the regulators themselves so that uh, uh, that this this cannot be a more uh, uh, audit point uh, furthermore because the whole landscape is now changing. Now they are willing to uh, accept a digital trail, a credible digital trail, which is very systematic in nature. So that is from the compliance perspective. And the only way is to introduce change on the actual business process level in a very patient manner. Because at many times, not only we would face the resistance from the business stakeholders, but also from the regulators and the auditors. Second perspective to it is the control. I would uh, like to quote two examples use of drones and use of uh, bulk SMS service providers. I think these are, uh, these are very two clear cut examples where we have uh, seen that how uh, on a month on month basis, uh, regulators and their influence to control the matters have affected our business operations. Earlier in the drone case, there were a lot of inhibitions. There were a lot of inequities, government policies, were not in place and everyone was very susceptible of, of what is the proper use of drones. If we have our own lease lands and assets, it's fine. But what is the maximum permissible height? Because once the drone goes up to your stack for the inspection, he can effectively have a bird's eye view of at least um, 0.5 kilometers. Uh, so these are the type of things but now since we have a very clear cut and the vendors the users themselves are very much aware that what are the various policies of drones i think the regulators have been very accommodative in that coming about uh, the bulk sms earlier we used to have sms's for everything each and everything which was connected to a computer based system we Make sure that it has an SMS based system for the purpose of notification. And I think the ages of that started that uh, to give a visibility that some digital system is working, a transaction is being recorded. Now, over a period of time, generating bulk SMSs and get, getting through a uh, try is a whole lot of people and a lot of uh, questions are being asked. So what we have aligned ourselves that not to use SMS-based medium for information broadcast, but to use more app-centric notification kind of things so that the trail is also there. It doesn't become much of an intrusion and the regulators are also comfortable. All in all, I want to just summarize that how the policies are enforced and how the things are changing and what all things are to be controlled. All these things are purely driven by the market forces. For some things, 
for which there were no policies five to six years back earlier data you previously now since that time we have social media platforms who have been in, indiscriminately using our personal data for their explanatory purposes there are now many policies around it that what should be called a private data and how should be a privacy be handled so how things evolve how regulators respond how the government policies are put in force all these are market forces and uh, effectively what everyone is trying to do is not to use indiscriminate use of these technologies and uh, make it a open a democratic space so that everyone has a fair chance to survive and thrive very very happy so thank you so much so just to clarify we are saying with changing tech the impact on compliance security also evolves and, and as some an industry we have been you know up to that and and regulations have never been indirect right? it has always been you know for, uh, helping businesses to be safe uh, ensuring customers who use it are safe and and ensuring that we prosper that's a great point to add uh, so thank you so much so manish beautifully articulated that 50 is all about uh, human societal and environment right uh, uh, goal this is for you right? while while we know 50 is a game changer uh, for business value uh, for the future of manufacturing um, why is esg so important for 50 evolution uh, thanks kamesh and uh... No, it's nice to be the part of this panel there so my views on this point uh, you know uh, industry 5.0 is actually more of human and less of tech i would say so human uh, and tech uh, when they coexist together no something like uh, you know in an environment like a cobot or in a very uh, you know in a very very uh, generic example if one one has to give then a farmer who is cultivating his his uh, uh, field with the help of a tiller which is a hand hand driven tractor that's also a very crude example of a cobot there because you know while there is not much of tech is involved there in that uh, you know tiller there but still so the the tiller is working in line with the farmer and mind you generally the farmer will be having some basic knowledge of uh, certain things there and still the the tool is able to work very very effectively with the with the human being human being is training that thing the same thing applies to to uh, industrial bot also or cobot also where you no know, esg things are uh, uh, you know uh, very very effectively handled now in the earlier times i would say and these are my personal views earlier times when uh, the the robotics were to be introduced there in a plant there used to be some uh, you know some uh, factors of workers and all that you no know, those unions and all that will be Uh, you know raising certain flags and all that raising the concerns rightfully because at that time uh, they must be feeling kind of concerned that their jobs or their work will be getting impacted whereas here it is going to be improving their uh, overall efficiency and not just the efficiency but the productivity also the overall uh, you know uh, outcome of that will be a collaborative effort so i would say it, it's a much a uh, much more evolved way of uh, automating a plant there or manufacturing setup or a, you know these kind of things are being done very very effectively there in the agri business also like in the meat producing industries there are huge number of examples of uh, cobots being worked there in automobile industry in aer- aerospace industry everywhere it is there and i think industry 5.0 uh, will be uh, getting a you know very very great kind of uh, revolution there in the in the manufacturing process overall where Uh, the bots will learn from human beings not the other way around actually so we will be training and with the help of with the advent of things like ai ml and cloud technologies and you know analytics and all that so this combination of uh, human beings and uh, a robot uh, will be analyzed by by machine learn- learning algorithms and all that where they will make both the things uh, you know uh, uh, operate more effectively and efficiently both the human being and the bot also so you tweak the bot by changing the programs or you know changing the hardware and all that on the other hand you you tweak the human being by upskilling or cross skilling that person there and then you know the overcome the outcome will be uh, or should be something very very great there i think it will be having a very very positive impact on the society uh, you know uh, very soon we will be having like like a simple vacuum cleaner what we are having at home that's also a classic example of a cobot there you know it's a 
it, it's you you can consider that as as industry 4.0 and i think alok your your company manufactures some beautiful uh, in this, uh, you know uh, robotic vacuum cleaners there so they work very closely with the human beings they avoid the collision with the human beings with the furniture and all that and they they do some basic thing which is cleaning the stuff there and keep uh, you know those viruses and all that also away from us which are there very very much there in the air so that's about it from my side i i love your optimism govind right at the base you are thinking next year we are going to wish each other happy engineers day happy fourth day right when we have a possible panel discussion like this but thank you so much right so so we get any feelings for the upliftment of human race uh, and humans and machines or bots working together is not new so it is something that we will manage uh, fantastic point go right uh, anupurna to you you articulated that it is necessary for us to understand current reality if possible leap from into 5.0 uh, and with all the digital uh, interventions that uh, uh, manish spoke about uh, uh, alok spoke about uh, there's a lot of emphasis on business going completely automated right and you will have millions of trillions and petabytes of data getting created and a lot of our decisions will be based on the data at some cases based on um, uh, an ai which makes the decisions for you right so you have all these human the amount of data what do you think should be a better strategy for uh, business sure so um kamish i think you know like like a lot of us said that um say industry 5.0 is that intersection of of human intelligence of robotics and of ai now as you think of the evolution of you know industry 5.0 right humans are what we are there isn't too much of evolution per se that's going to happen there um you know robotics it's with there is a lot of these um, you know newer robots that are coming say from fano or from um, you know uh, universal robots which operate seamlessly as cobots like the way uh, govin mentioned right now the third part which is ai right that in its essence is data so if you if we have to think about the evolution of industry 5.0 right in terms of curves it will follow a very close curve to the evolution of ai evolution and adoption of ai right now you know when we think about ai and sort of peel it down a layer at the heart is data right today when we look at our manufacturing setups right it's 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 been a journey it's been a journey where we've started off with enabling right we use data to enable certain actions right and um, you know we we spoke about a couple of examples that if this is the parameter if you know this is the pressure value the boiler needs to shut right um we move from there to measuring right to consistently measuring certain values to understand that um you know what's what's the trend what are we seeing what is the maximum productivity at right from there once we started observing we move to optimizing that oh if this is the trend this is where we see the maximum productivity and therefore we should keep you know these parameters constant but we are moving from there to analyzing this data to transforming this data to leveraging this data for predictive analysis right diagnosis and that part is still a journey that that that's still a journey now when you when you look at the data strategy that needs to come to be able to support it right at the heart of it is a lot of technologies coming together right it is that whole cloud enablement it is being able to manage data at scale it is um, you know bringing in the ability to bring in very capable data governance right uh, putting in the right control infrastructure to make sure that the data is truly self serve bringing in standards right because at the heart of this is democratization of data if we truly want that technology to mature we have to think about what do we need to put in place as pillars and guardrails to really democratize that data right now if we are able to achieve that right we will be able to help keep pace with the growth of industry 5.0 you know these these are two three concepts that need to mature in parallel at the same pace 
so that we are able to grow so today if you, if you know if when i look at cummins in the cummins environment we have a lot of cobots for example that are operating with a combination of a few different types of sensing and ai technology so while the cobot in itself may have a sensor right we will have a um, a camera which tracks you know the movement and therefore there will be vision based analytics and therefore the cobot will respond based on vision based analytics right now when you think about the possibilities as the ai stream and as the data stream matures right this whole possibilities becomes extremely endless right so in my mind these technologies need to you know move forward at the same pace or at the right pace and be lockstep and barrel to truly enable industry 5.0 you know from moving from being a concept right a, a concept that's great on on paper to something that we literally see on every shop floor that we walk right brilliant anabola uh, but personally for me uh, when we ask the first time uh, you use reality five times and this time anabola you use possibility six times right so that is a great win you know for industry for you know but the very valid point right so we're moving from um, uh, data at one place to bring in data signals all together to build the infrastructure to put the guard rails and bring context to all this data so that you know we make meaningful decisions for us and for the box and because that is critical to success brilliantly articulated thank you so much for that so with, with all these things coming into uh, uh, reality and right? we spoke about how this is a business problem it is not a tech problem going you really articulated about that this is going to be the future is business ready or do they trust the the tech leadership to actually take this forward right through this is for you right how do you go about convincing your business coming to your board that 500 is something that we have to invest on so uh, i would respond to that in the landscape of our uh, business and our group as a conglomerate at art there are mixed mixed approaches to it and i would uh, uh, primarily attribute that the reason to the extent of inertia what the board envisions the perspective of change management so giving giving uh, giving it a more uh, practical example i'll a quote of uh, the electrical uh, electric scooters which has recently emerged and uh, stormed the market so at one side we have traditional biggies like bajajs the like tvss who are very much into two wheeler manufacturing and they are trying to churn out the best electric scooter out there and in one side we have Ola scooters out of nowhere they have stormed the market and made the scooter which is far more exceeding than the what a TVS and Bajaj has envisioned. Now reason being in that what I see at least for myself that uh, both the earlier conglomerates Bajaj and TVS were very and had a tremendous inertia on how their business processes and their whole or setup has to be changed. in order to orient themselves to be a more electric in nature whereas when it comes to ola it was a scratch up so effectively there was no change management whatever uh, whatever their their board decides that was done and hence the best product was made now same applies to us for couple of our uh, basic standardization digital projects we face no challenge because everyone in the board and our stakeholders our shareholders feel that all those things are pretty much necessary and important for us to be sustainable if we don't do those things in right time maybe we might lose out on the race and then there we have a couple of moon shots also now those moon shots those are some things which no one generally expects us to but getting a trust to get those things and getting the people and the technology ready to get those moon shot things thing that invokes a significant commitment in terms of the resources from the board so we have challenges in uh, deliberating and identifying the right approach and the right time to go for those moon shots but when it comes to the basics keeping the business 
running i think we we uh, we uh, take a progressive approach a planned phased wise approach so that the business processes and the people are not much impacted changes introduced in a in a very seamless way although it is <laughs> never a seamless i would say based upon my experience but uh, that is that is that is how our board sees sees the things and places their trust into the digital technology leadership so you saying signals of change will come in from competition from customers watch for it it then gets easier for you to go back and you know discuss with the board to say this is what competition is doing this is what customer need now it's time to transform or be disrupted into that transformation thank you so much for that um uh, i i will go to go in next uh, uh, and then have a leading question for dr day after that um, so when you you said it is not new right machines and men have been working together for long uh, the only difference is this time machines are slightly more smarter now there are hundreds of things you can do on fiber zero to anyone guess but if you have to go back and stitch together a demand pipe how do you go about prioritizing Uh, uh, the use cases uh, uh, for your 5.0 program. So, industry 5.0, as you rightly said, uh, Kamesh and other panelists also here. You know, they are they are become smarter and smarter. So, one of the thing which is which will be my my personal favorite uh, in the use case will be uh, the scalability aspects and and uh, you know the security aspects and and visibility visibility of you know what work is being done by. by the plant and all now the reason why i will choose scalable scalability is because india is growing very very fast and i'm saying this in context with india only now whether you take the sensex or you you know check the uh, you know gdp of the country and all that we all are going northwards gladly uh, this will mean that my strategy from the it side should be aligned with the marketing strategy sales strategy manufacturing strategy and so on and so forth now i would like to deploy something which can feedback the information directly coming from from the from the plant into my erp application into my other legacy applications what i'll be having and generate some meaningful analytics and feed it back to directly to the to the machines there so that they become smarter more effective and more efficient and all that now technologically or technically it is all possible now we have companies like kuka and companies like fanok and all that now as anupam was saying anupam was saying uh, all those things are there but how do we utilize those things they are in the in the in the plant or in the in the manufacturing area that will be something which will be my personal uh, favorite choice and this will be possible only if i am able to make my manufacturing head the fan of the initiative which i want to do so you know if i can convince him or her that hey this is what we are going to be doing this will make your make your uh, you know manufacturing uh, capacity completely scalable by tweaking certain things there by extending the shared and you know all all those kind of things will all, always be involved but overall it can give you a visibility from that sense and you can plan it out better that will be a very very clear winner and then things like leveraging uh, you know on on iot and you know other new age technologies and all that which are again clubbed with the big data analytics and all that we can do a lot of collaboration with our cross functional uh, you know partners business partners there or our industry peers or our competitors even so there is a lot of data which is available there not in the private domain uh, not not in the public domain but yeah we can we can gather some sanitized data from our industry peers from our you know uh, similar companies which can help us and then then mine that data analyze that and then figure out if it really can help us to uh, you know to to keep up to the business demands and asks what we are having and and the last thing will be on the operational intelligence part now operational intelligence is is not just running a you know a, a setup effectively and efficiently and all that but also to ensure the security aspects are intact now you know i i think some alok you were saying that about the security uh, security will become even more critical and important to us in the in the coming uh, weeks and months not even years actually coming weeks and months it will become more and more critical and important you know with the with the uh, hackers uh, you know getting more and more smarter and you know new new technologies coming up there quantum computing is is round the corner no when those things are coming are we really ready to to uh, you know beat those challenges what we are having because if there is a if there is a hacking attempt on your uh, connected factory setup 
uh, then your entire you know uh, value of of the uh, shareholders is also going down your company uh, you know the complete reputation your complete productivity says everything will go down. so i will i will be uh, taking one initiative there in these lines also where i i make my operating operating environment more and more effective intelligent and secure so go and i i i love the way you closely aligned with your business you spoke about across growth efficiency risk and security and you said uh, i'm not going to prioritize amongst them i'm going to ensure that i pick one across each one of them to ensure that i move forward while you spoke about your personal favorite i'm going to speak about my own personal favorite uh, this is to dr bay um, i i i believe supply chain you know um, uh, when automated to its fullest strength can have a lasting impact on the entire value chain of you know industry but do you see in the same you know for lens stock right do you think if you automate supply chain it is going to bring down a lot of problems that manufacturing you know so are actually facing currently sure uh, it's a great question and uh, i think dhruv and gavin both talked about the business adoptions as well as challenges you keep the intelligent automations but also make it secure and uh, those are uh, directions now coming to your question of supply chain whether it is productions you take an agri environment or any kind of manufacturing environment you have the procurement to warehousing bringing to floors building products delivering so it's a full chain right and we have been doing this but so far i believe you know we've been looking into making things happen i need to procure things i need to get things done and the cost benefit analysis is something that people have been doing but i think it is becoming much bigger than that and let me go back to what i said in the beginning the machine does few things well right repetitive task i get consistent result mundane things low value for human automations if three steps could be combined into one why not uh drew was talking about compliance audit trail aesthetics that i talked about look and feel the time consumptions if we can see it so these are typical benefits why we are bringing machines on the other hand all the panelists and by definition of industry 5.0 we all are saying it's an human centric movement right so the human must be coming into the play it's not about all machines so what is happening in my opinion in this supply chain analysis it's not just cost benefit it's not just making things happen it's what i think manish talked about society 5.0 these dimensions will play a bigger role and therefore i would like to see machines human machines human machines human this is the sequence of events in that chain and as i talked about where machine does well and therefore you know let it be happening for one of those reasons that i just outlined and then we talk about human and uh, annapurna has been talking about the human centricity and she also brought a good point that human evolution is not happening but the machines are evolving but we are already an evolved species and still the distance is quite far maybe our perceptions our fear of the machine is much higher than our ability so therefore i would think that now it's a time and this is exactly the reason why industry 5.0 would be adopted very quickly because it's all about human it's about our benefit it's getting rid of those fears it's building something together and that together coming back to your supply chain i would go back and say this part of the thing machine does and then i take over just to give an example and we are uh, working and i i handle the samsung smart things in a big way that is our home iot uh, intelligent platform we have 190 million devices connected uh, and globally the data platform and these we have been able to integrate uh, we have this manufacturing facility that i talked about where we are adopting things but when i look into that we see that where we should be applying the human intelligence when they launched 5g first time the 5g came we deployed into a factory i think in korea december 
we launched the 5G first. And uh, three of the operators in Korea, they work. And we deployed in a manufacturing facility to be able to detect because the latency is very low. And therefore, I should be able to spot if a manufacturing defect comes. So I should be able to spot and then do whatever it is. Now, the machine plays a good role because I have surveillance. I think Arnabhata talked about also video surveillance and some of the other examples that came up. We have a lot of AI in audio, in video, in data intelligence that we could integrate and observe and continuously monitor. You know, uh, I think the, the Govind also gave an example of our uh, the vacuum cleaner at home. And that's doing the job, but it's also monitoring. If you know these newer products, this can go around in the home, not only doing the job, but if there is a sensor in that uh, vacuum cleaner, which can smell, you know, if something is burning, we could take that. So anything that is continuous monitoring, it's machine's job. I'm not there. Right. But once it is detected, once you notify into that, then I should be able to take action. So this is the whole supply chain, whether it is manufacturing, anything, you know, it's a production line. All of these bigger systems is a production line. It's an alternations between that machines and the human operate. And uh, we can take the examples of not just there, but also today we're doing uh, face to face or near, let's say, robotic surgery you could also think of like remote operations. So collaborative robotics, uh, this mindset change paradigm shift that working alongside human being of robots and this, this is uh, quite interesting and quite beneficial to society <laughs> building that 5.3. Absolutely, you. absolutely, uh, doctor, right? So put machines and you have a sustainable working supply chain and, and that, that is the success of it. I'm going to have one last question for Manish. Uh, uh, Manish, you're going to talk about what are those key secret ingredients for a successful digital transformation? But the only you know catch there is Manish, you have 45 seconds to talk about those secrets because you can't explain them. So we're going to rush through that secret stuff, and and we have a lot of audience who will reach out to you for a, a detailed advice on it. So now you're asking me to disclose our secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think that's a very, very interesting question. And to be honest, uh, there are not those kind of you know, silver bullets that you can say that, you know, you know these are the things that you follow. Uh, uh, however, we can always recommend a framework. And in that concept, I would probably quote what McKinsey Digital Transformation uh, Model kind of you know, recommends that in order to kind of you know, technology to drive value, there could be four key ingredients. Uh, one could be product innovation. The second could be automation. Third could be uh, connectivity. And fourth, improved decision making through the technology. You know, whatever insights you get from your AI, ML, you know, you can make a more informed decision, so to say. Now, just to give an example from a Panasonic point of view, what we have done around see similar lines, we have created our own homegrown uh, smart factory solutions uh, designed and conceptualized and everything done from India Innovation Center, uh, where we have followed some of these practices. Apart from that, we have kind of you know, introduced a lot of you know, technologies into that. You know, it is our industrial IoT platform. There's a lot of AI built in. It provides a lot of visualization of the data. It gives you a lot of insights. It tells you your machines you know, uptime, downtime, it tells you the quality of the product which is coming out of your systems. It tells you the quality of the welding that has been done by welding upload robots. It tells you, you know, the quality of molds which are coming from your molding machines. That is how we have expanded. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, you know, Panasonic has very, uh, a lot of breadth and depth in terms of manufacturing. And we have, you know, kind of, you know, leverage all that history in order to come up with this kind of you know, solution. Uh, we have our own CNC machines, molding machines, welding robots, and that is what we are utilizing and adding a software layer on top of that, uh, you know, in order to kind of you know, get all those insights. 
I'm also trying to wear my sales hat to tell all these, you know, sell all these solutions to my industry colleagues, Dhruv, Govind, Alok, Annapurna, and maybe we will connect offline. <laughs> So that's how I would kind of you know summarize, and there is a lot of ROIs that you can get out of these solutions. Brilliant, uh, Manish. Right, but by doing that, you're uh, uh, putting us consultants out of job. Uh, uh, but I, I love that answer. That there is no silver bullet. You should be a consultant because you never gave us the answer. You kept it as a secret, and you also you know went into sell when you have a larger gamut but i love that answer thank you so much manish um, um fantastic i i love the energy i i love uh, all your insights uh, i have to pass the pattern back to uh, uh dimble and, and ev uh, but thank you so much for this uh, over to you back uh, please kick up please over to you all right so uh, Kamish, while I was very interestingly listening to you, uh, I have to say thank you to you for your moderatorship and panel. Thank you very much for an engrossing discussion on Industry 5.0 Intelligent Automation. And indeed, uh, in fact, a very, very happy Engineers Day 2021 to all those uh, hardworking engineers who play an emphatic role, I would say, to make this planet better and, of course, technologically advanced. Well, uh, for every day's information, those of you who would not know, this day is marked to celebrate the birth anniversary of our Bharat Ratna M. Visvesvarya, who was a civil engineer and a divan of Mysore, known for his pioneering works. And with that, uh, having said that, ladies and gentlemen, for the manufacturing track, it's time for a closing conversation right there. So allow us to come back while you all could in the meanwhile, yes, very much join the NetApp booth at the exhibition space and fill in their feedback forms because 10 lucky winners, I repeat myself, 10 lucky winners would stand an opportunity to win Amazon vouchers, worth INR 1000 each. I think that's good endorphins. And if you are all up, you know, just like me to have some extra leader, leaderboard points out there, please visit the Kindrel booth also. And do not forget to fill in the feedback forms there as well. So uh, have a happy endorphin or endorphin rush uh, that you're experiencing right now at the platform. And with the discussions, I will see you just in a few seconds. <laughs>